Madison here from Learning at the Primary Pond. I am so excited because I have a guest with me today. This is Becky Newell. Hey, Becky. Hey, Allison. I'm excited because for the past couple of weeks, if you've been following my blog, then you might already know that I've been focusing on word work and word study and phonics. And one aspect of this topic that I'm really interested in and have been trying to learn more about is how to help students with dyslexia or with reading difficulties, how to support them with their word work and phonics learning and all that good stuff. And that is something that Becky knows a lot about. So very happy to bring her on so that she can share her expertise with all of us. So thank you for being here, Becky. Well, thank you so much for having me, Allison. I really appreciate it. Um, and I'm so excited. I love this topic and I love talking about it. So I'm excited. Awesome. Well, why don't you start by just letting everyone know who you are and what you do? Great, great. Um, okay, so like Allison said, my name is Becky. Um, I work with Ascend Learning and Educational Consulting, which is out here a Denver-based um, company where we work with kids that have dyslexia um, and do everything from one-on-one -on -one tutoring to parent consulting to teacher consulting. Um, and we also have a curriculum that we've created that we work on with kids, for kids with reading-based learning disabilities, such as dyslexia. Cool, lots of different things. Yeah, lots of stuff. <laughs> so one thing I'm wondering is if, you know, I'm working with a classroom of kids or just a group of kids, are there any red flags that I should be looking for when I'm trying to figure out, you know, maybe does a student have dyslexia or reading difficulty? What are some things that we can look out for? That is a great question, um, and that's so important. Um, I think it's probably one of the most important questions for teachers to be thinking about, because you're in there and you've got you know 30 plus students, and maybe some are kind of lagging behind or in your slower reading group, but how do you know? Or maybe you're even a kindergarten teacher or something, and you're not even um, too worried about or teaching explicit reading, and you're coming into just wondering if there's some pre-reading red flags, and we definitely, we definitely love when teachers ask that question because we want them to be looking at it early on. And um, there's actually some really great, um, great things to look for, some great easy red flags to look for in my opinion. So what I would say is um, the first thing I would look for is rhyming difficulty. So if my kiddo is having a hard time rhyming, then that for me would be a clue that they might have a reading disability, they might struggle as they go forward with learning how to read because rhyming is one of those phonological awareness um, strategies that's really important for reading. Um, another one I would look for is um, any kind of sequencing. So even if you have pre-readers and you notice that one of your kiddos is having a hard time with patterns or sequencing, even um, like blocks or something like that, recognizing patterns like you would for math, Mm -hmm. um that can that can be a red flag for a reading difficulty as I well i did not know that that's really interesting yeah so that's like that's one of those um one of those things yeah you can be looking for and say like huh that's interesting like and then i might pull my kid aside and or pull that kid aside and be like all right like can you i'm gonna say a word and i want you to come up with a word that rhymes with it i said cat what rhymes with cat and you know if they really struggle with that like in, and you give them multiple chances then I, that would be something significant for me where i'd be like okay like i'm gonna try and work on some of this phonemic awareness um i'm gonna try and work on some of this rhyming or something like that but that i would definitely look out for as a teacher um can so, sorry to interrupt you can oh. so typically before we ask kids to generate rhyming words we're asking them you know do cat and hat rhyme mm -hmm. do those kids with dyslexia are they able to like orally figure out? Or Great question. Orally figure that out? Um, typically that'll be hard. Mm -hmm. um, so typically if you say do cat and hat rhyme, if, um, so totally, I do that like as a, before I ask them to create rhyme, mm -hmm. I would ask them like, do these two words rhyme? Um, that's a perfect example. So, um, and uh, the, if you have dyslexia, that, that would be hard for you to hear. Mm -hmm. So you'd be like, you might notice that the kiddo is guessing, like you might see them looking at your face kind of for like hints to like, if you're like, does cat and hat rhyme? <laughs> then they might be like, yes, <laughs> you know, but, um, and then you might notice that they'll confuse things. Like you might say, um, you know, do, um, 
let me try and think for a second. Um, do Cat and Kate rhyme? And they might say yes to that just because it starts with the same initial sound. Mm -hmm. So they'll have a hard time with initial sound. Any of that phonemic awareness stuff, that initial sound. I saw um, one of your great uh, um, Instagram posts where you had the pictures and you have like initial, final, and inner, and um, medial sound. Yeah. And for those CVC words, and that is like such a great activity that you have um, that teachers can use to kind of recognize is a kiddo struggling with this phonemic awareness? Are they struggling with initial sound? Are they struggling with final sound um, or medial sound? Um, for sure. So that's a great, that would be a great tool to use <laughs> to find red flags, honestly, to look for red flags. Um, other things are, you know, if you have some older students, a little bit older students, are they applying the spelling rules that you're teaching them? You know, like you've taught them a spelling rule, do they apply it? If they're not applying it, then, and all, and your other students are, you notice like mostly my students apply it. So most people in the class got it. Mm -hmm. This kiddo's not, you know, that's a red flag. Um, and then other stuff like reading slowly. So if they can read, but their um, fluency uh, is poor and they're having a hard time with their speed and accuracy, they keep kind of stumbling they go back and they reread, or it seems as though they've memorized it. And what I mean by that is um, they'll sub out words that you'll see. This is a very common dyslexic thing. They'll sub out for, like the word for, F-O-R, for the word of, or something like that. And they'll sub out the and a or and. Mm -hmm. So these little articles, they'll start subbing them out because they're not reading them. And they're kind of guessing and making the sentence work in their head. Interesting. So that's... Um, so you notice you're not like actually reading the sentence word for word, mm -hmm. then that would be, a, I'd be like, hmm, like they have at some, they can kind of figure out through context what's happening in the story and they're going to start guessing. So it's like a strategy that they've learned to cope, mm -hmm. even though it doesn't really work. Yeah. It's really them well. Yeah, no, totally, totally. Because they, 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 you know, if they haven't been explicitly taught reading strategies and they're struggling with it, they're going to use whatever they can to figure out how to kind of accomplish this task. And so you'll see these little, what I call potholes, you'll see these potholes where they, they're reading along and then like, they, yeah, they miss a word or they sub the word out or they just seem to finish the sentence and it's not quite right. You're like, mm. <laughs> that's weird. <laughs> um, so those are things to look for. Um, and um, the other thing I would think of, um, you know, is like around vocabulary is students like uh, struggling to define words where it always seems like it's on the tip of their tongue and they're just kind of like, all right, uh, they're subbing out, you know, other words, you know, synonyms and stuff like that, but they're having a hard time actually kind of grasping. Like producing the vocabulary too, right? Yes. Yeah, exactly. That's, yeah, thank you. Um, so those are some different red flags. Um, in fact, my um, colleague just wrote a, a blog post about red flags. So um, that's something to think about in terms of like, um, they can go over there and check that, teachers can go over there and check that out. And we have a free resource for that that I can link you to at the end. Awesome, we will definitely put that in the blog post under this video, awesome, <laughs> thanks. Yeah. So keeping with their focus on word work and phonics instruction, when you have a struggling reader or a child who has dyslexia, what should effective word work instruction look like for those kiddos? That's a great question. So um, when I think about effective instruction, I really do, um, you know, Orton Gillingham would be kind of like the big um, umbrella um, category for how to teach kids with dyslexia or reading-based learning disabilities. And the basis behind um, effective reading instruction um, through Orton Gillingham would be that it is structured. So that means that there's, you know, an order in which you're teaching it. So when you're working with a kiddo um, with a reading-based learning disability or dyslexia, you really want to make sure that you're teaching them the easiest stuff first and then increasingly getting more difficult. And so, um, so that they can always have that um, foundation that they're building on and they can come back to 
and you're going to always be kind of repeating back some of that foundational easier level stuff and then build on top of that instead of just bringing in all sorts of different random pieces of reading instruction you really want it to be sequential and structured so that they can follow the patterns and understand that the patterns are building on each other and not and not feel like it's completely random because for a kid with dyslexia reading and letters and language feels completely random so you're trying to kind of show them through explicit instruction that there is a method to this crazy language and that there's um <laughs> and that there's you know there there is sense to it like as difficult as the english language is there is a lot of logical sense to it and if you can really break it apart into its pieces and teach a kid that they're going to be much more successful when reading and they're going to feel a lot more successful um is they can't see those patterns themselves whereas a non-dyslexic reader is going to pick up on those patterns just kind of intuitively a dyslexic will not pick up on those patterns yeah um, so yeah so it's that explicit um instruction it's that um so you're explicitly teaching them the rules you're not asking them to just notice the rules or just get it through osmosis like so when i teach a lesson i say you know today we're going to talk about closed syllables a closed syllable ends in a consonant and the vowel makes it short vowel sound repeat that back to me what is a closed syllable so it's very explicit instruction and then it's also sequential in that it's starts out easy and gets more difficult. And then other pieces that um, are important are multi-sensory, so bringing in more senses, which can look like a lot of things. We can kind of talk about that. Um, it doesn't have to look like shaving cream and Play-Doh and sand trays if you don't have that. It can be much more simple than that. Yeah. Um, and still be multi-sensory. Um, and so, that's kind of, I feel like the nuts and bolts of a really like effective word work is really explicit instruction and then keeping it structured. Cool. And as we talked about earlier, what I told Dougie before we started the recording here was just that that to me sounds like effective instruction for all kids. So. Yes, definitely. And it is. And that's what we like to say. We like to say, this is a way you can teach 100% of kids to learn how to read or whole language teaches 80% of kids to learn how to read. So I want to be a hundred percent personally. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's a, so yeah. So teach phonics. <laughs> okay. So when um, you kind of mentioned this earlier with the syllable types, but something that I think I, I am positive that I didn't learn this in undergrad, or at least if I did, I completely forgot it. But something that I think a lot of teachers are never taught is that there are six syllable types in the English language, correct? That's correct. And you're absolutely right. You, I'm, I feel fairly certain you did not learn it <laughs> in undergrad. I don't feel like anyone does. In fact, I feel like teachers have to seek it out and it's generally some sort of Orton Gillingham training when they learn that there's six syllable types of English language. And that's, that's the foundation to all of our words. And so that's, that's how we teach struggling readers. We teach them very explicitly. And I say, like on the first day I meet with a new student, I say, there's six syllable types. We're gonna learn all six of them. Today, we're gonna learn one of them. Once you learn all six of them, then you have all the Lego pieces you need to build every single word in our language. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> so yeah, so those six syllable types. So um, let me just talk about that for a second. So I'm just gonna go through them. So six syllable types. So the first one is closed syllables. So um, that's kind of your simplest syllable type um, where you have the short vowel sound um, and it ends in a consonant. So any word that ends, any one syllable, sorry, not word, but one syllable that ends in a consonant, like the word it would be an example, ends in a consonant, the t, the t saying t, and the vowel is making it short vowel sound. It's saying it. Um, same with word cat. So it can be a bigger word because also words like um, flick or um peck where it ends in two consonants mm -hmm. that's also a closed syllable so it ends in a consonant one or two or more and the vowels making it short vowel sound that ah or i or e eh, um sound and then so that's our closed syllables then the next syllable type would be open syllables so that's ends in a vowel so ends in a e i o u or y and the vowel says a name so that'd be like a word like me 
So it ends in the letter E and the E says E, me. <laughs> um, then we've got our bossy R or our R controlled syllables. So those are syllables that have a vowel followed by the letter R. So A R, E R, I R, U R, O R. Um, and that just means that the R is controlling the vowel sound. So A R says R, and then I R, E R, and U R all say er, <laughs> and then O R says or. Um, so that's R controlled. Are the are the words that have sorry to interrupt you? Are the words that have like A R E that falls into that category as well or no? Okay, like the word R A R E. Um. Or are you thinking like um? Care the word cares. Ah, uh, no, great question. So care doesn't. So okay. very good. Okay, so so what we're looking for this is a great question. So what we're really looking for when we're thinking about syllables is the vowel sound. So in a bossy R syllable or an R controlled syllable the vowel is being controlled by the R, and so you're getting that R sound, like A-R says R, like in car. Um, in the word care, that's our next syllable type, that's gonna be the silent E syllable type, or magic E, depending on how you wanna teach it. Doesn't make a difference to me. Um, <laughs> magic E, silent E, and so that's the E at the end, so if you get that vowel consonant E pattern, so one consonant followed by that E, it comes back, it makes the vowel say it's a long sound. So that is tricky where you come across and that when you're teaching kids, they're going to be like, wait, it says A-R. Mm -hmm. And you're like, okay, so the tricky part about magic E or silent E is that the kiddo has to be looking ahead. Um, you know, they have to go beyond just their reading, you know, they're sounding out the words in order. They have to go beyond to see, is there a magic E that's affecting this vowel? So that's a really tricky part, and I find that magic E or silent E is one of the hardest syllable types for kids to grasp because that jumping ahead is very hard yeah, um, to understand. Um, so then, um, so we have closed, open, bossy R, magic E, silent E. Um, then we also have our consonant LE syllable type, so that's our final stable syllable, sometimes people call it. Mm -hmm. um, so that's any word that ends in consonant L-E. So you have kids look for words that are ending in E and then jump back through to they have an L and a consonant, any consonant. And then you're talking about how that's actually a two syllable word and that consonant L-E is the second syllable. So like in, well, whistle is kind of a little bit of an exception because that S-T-L-E, but you know, table is a good <laughs> example where you get that B-L-E. Um, and then the last one, Though usually I teach consonant LE last, but it doesn't really matter. Um, the last one is vowel teams. So two vowels that work together as a team. So any of those E, 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 A, A, I, and that's your biggest syllable type. It has the most mm -hmm. variation in it because there's a lot of yes. vowel teams. <laughs> and I still, I, I teach each and every one of those vowel teams explicitly. So I'll say, today we're going to learn about this vowel team. It's the A, I vowel team. A and I work together. They make this sound. Um, what sound does AI make? And I have them repeat it back to me. And so it's that explicit and then that, you know, I wouldn't teach vowel teams before I teach closed because closed is simpler. Okay. Does that make sense? Yes, absolutely. So those are your six syllable types. <laughs> cool. That's, so that's really the basis. I would say that's the, the real, that's the foundation of teaching kids with a learning disability how to read. It's understanding those six and then building off of that. Awesome. So something that I kind of wanted to point out that I noticed you doing is when we say the letter sounds, um, we try to clip them. Yes. You know what I'm talking about? Yes. So not having the schwa sound at the end of a... Yeah. Yes. So when Becky was saying the letter sounds, sometimes I find myself just out of habit. Instead of saying M for the letter M, sometimes kids or teachers can accidentally say M, right? Perfect, yes. And you know, I still do that as long as I've been doing this. I still sometimes add that yeah. what's called schwa, that uh sound to the end of a consonant instead of clipping it, like you said. Yes. So you want to be very cognizant of that when you're working with dyslexic kids, because if you have a kiddo who's you're teaching the rules explicitly, they're working really hard, and you say k a t, they're gonna spell it C U A T U or something like that. <laughs> you yeah. know, they're gonna they're gonna add that uh sound in there. Yeah. yeah, that's a great point. Thanks for pointing that out. Yeah, of course. So what are some activities that you found are super effective um, when you're working on phonics or word work with those struggling readers or kiddos with dyslexia? 
Yeah, absolutely. Well, I think a really important thing to keep in mind when you're working with a dyslexic kid or a struggling reader is that um, that you want to kind of um, give them multiple ways to understand what you're teaching them, right? So that's that's that can be that multi-sensory piece where maybe um, you know. So a concrete thing that we like to use for um, multi-sensory is we sometimes put when we're doing our spelling words, we'll put um, grid paper underneath their piece of paper. So when they're writing on top of it, they feel the grid, and that gives them a little bit of that tactile feel. That's so you can cool. get like plastic grid paper at like Michael's and just mm -hmm. cut it into little squares and have your students use that. Um, so that's like a concrete way to kind of add a multi-sensory piece, which kids really like, because it just, it helps them with spelling, but it also is just kind of a little different and mixes it up. But the main thing I would say overall is in any way you can gamifying what you're doing with them. And <laughs> I mean, like, I do like the silliest things with kids to make it into a game. Like pretty much anything can be like a card game. If I just take, um, you know, three by five index cards and um, I'll do different. So for the six syllable types, I'll do different syllables on each index card. And then I do a sort with them. And even if just having the kids sort them can be like a game, you can time them or you can kind of play war with them and have them play kind of a card game with it. Um, we have created a bunch of games that we give it like on Fridays, we give out free games to people who swing by our website. Um, but so different stuff like that, where it's like any way you can kind of make it a fun game for them where they can be doing a different activity than just reading or just spelling. Cause it can be frankly, really boring. <laughs> like I do like, like I am very, very passionate about teaching kids how to read, but I'm not going to lie. Like it can be really boring sometimes <laughs> and it's hard. It's really stinking hard. And so if the kiddo can, if you can make it into a game for them, um, or if you can find games that incorporate, um, that you can work in. And the important thing to think about though, when you're gamifying is not just to pull in any random game that you think is even if it's a phonics game, not pulling in any random game, like, so um, making sure that the games are still falling into, I've taught this activity to the kiddo, they know, you know, they understand what magic E syllables are, so therefore, I'm going to play this game, this magic E game with them, you know, instead of just randomly pulling in any game, like still keeping it structured and thoughtful mm -hmm. in your approach when you're teaching, um, but trying to have it be kind of a little bit more fun. And so you said every Friday, there's a, is there a blog post every Friday? With the yeah, so we do a freebie Friday every Friday. So um, we have a blog post and then you can download from that freebie Friday. You can download a PDF of like a free game or free resource of some, usually it's games, but there's other resources, like some writing resources and stuff like that too. Cool. We'll definitely link to that in the post. So if you're watching this, go and check that out. Um, was there, were there any other activities you wanted to mention for? Um, yeah, so I think then, so any kind of gamifying and then um, ways of making it multi-sensory. So um, with your younger kiddos, so if you're working with like kindergarten kiddos or something like that, um, I always like to bring in, um, you know, like we talked about with phonemic awareness, any kind of rhyming. So mm -hmm. using nursery rhymes and um, also like any kind of songs that bring in rhyming for the kids to be practicing their rhyming. and and then like whenever I do any alphabet work with the younger kiddos, like kindergarten and first grade kiddos, um, I always do the alphabet as the sounds. So instead of saying A, B, C, D, I do the abba, kind mm -hmm. of alphabet. So yeah. really reinforcing that the letters aren't just these crazy random shapes, but they make sounds. <laughs> I like that because in our culture, and not all cultures are this way, but there's so much focus on the letter names, which sure. isn't a bad thing, but the letter sounds are really what teach the kids to read. So there's that that interesting divide. So I like that. I like that yeah. way in the alphabet. That's cool. Yeah, totally. So yeah, I love that. Any kind of, any way I can. In fact, I was just reading Chicka Chicka Boom Boom earlier today. <laughs> and in that book, like I'll, I'll just, instead of making it be the letter names, even though that is what creates the rhyme in the book. Yeah at the end I'll always do like the letter sounds too <laughs> um yeah so cool. yeah thinking about that phonemic awareness always <laughs> absolutely um and so then 
a lot of us use like an independent or at least somewhat independent word work center or you know we do daily five and there's work on words so when we have a student or students who maybe are struggling with reading phonics all that stuff how can we support them in that center how can we kind of structure it so that they can be successful also that's a great question um so I think it's important. Um, so a lot of times when you have those centers and groups, like you'll be breaking it up kind of by ability or level a lot of times. Um, and so you might have like a group of like three or four kids that maybe are all struggling together on the same um, area. Again, what I'd want to do for those kiddos um, when I'm working in that center with them is keeping it um, structured and explicit. And then when, um, so what I like to do with them is, so say I'm teaching them just one rule. If it, they're struggling readers, I'm teaching them like that one rule. Mm -hmm. And there's gonna be, say it's a group of three or four kids and say three of them get it, but one of them doesn't get it, right? So then you're really struggling. You're like, all right, this one kiddo is not getting this one rule. How do I work with them on that? Um, so then what I'd wanna do for that kiddo is try to see if I can't, um, you know, pair them with another kid to have them be playing some of the games. So I wouldn't want to pair them with another kid to be doing work um, because that might feel, they might feel unsuccessful or they might feel frustrated that the other kid, you know, one kid's getting it and they're not. Um, but playing some of the games, um, and that's where I like gamifying because what you can do is you say you're teaching, um, you know, closed syllables for the whole class, but then you have your centers and you have kind of your, your um, some kids are getting it quicker. And so they're kind of, you can do more advanced word work with them and some kids are getting it. It's more of a struggle for them and it's more slow for them. You can still have them all playing the same games. You're still going to have them all playing closed syllable games because that's what I introduced in, you know, whole group. And so, um, and so then when I break it into centers, one of my centers can be games and they can be working together or, um, you know, when I'm working with them one-on-one, -on -one, then really kind of reinforcing through um, multi-sensory, so, and multi-sensory, so just so I can, I'll be clear here, multi-sensory, like I said before, it doesn't have to be sand tables and shaving cream, so what can it be? Yeah. Um, it can be, you know, anything where you're saying the word, you want them to really feel, for the tactile, they can really feel the sounds in their mouth. So that's kind of like a speech language thing. And I'm not trained in speech language, but when you talk to and work with speech language pathologists, so if you're lucky enough at your school to have access to a speech language pathologist, grab them <laughs> and ask them <laughs> because they're an incredible resource when it comes to reading. Um, because um, there's a lot of tactile things to be thinking about and the kiddos, you wanna be pointing it out to them. So. For instance, with like, um, if they're struggling with their vowel sounds, which would be common for a struggling reader, they might have a really hard time with the difference between a, ah, the short vowel for the letter A, and eh, the short mm -hmm. vowel for the letter E. And so I really exaggerate what my mouth looks like, and I say a ah, for A, for that short vowel A, and then I say eh. And I actually stick my tongue out, and I have my kiddos stick their tongue out. Like I go, over the top with it um, <laughs> so that they can feel there's a difference in their mouth shape. So, um, so working on some of that tactile stuff. So that can be a way of bringing in tactile to your multi-sensory without having to bring shaving cream to the table or something like that. <laughs> cool. Um, anything else you wanted to mention about the word work center or independent work when they're on their own? Um, Oh, independent work when they're on their own. I would say for independent work when they're on their own, checking in, <laughs> checking in on them or pairing them with somebody if you can. I know this is really hard for teachers in the classroom. I know when I was working in the classroom how hard it was to do this, but if you can pair them up or have them work with someone that's feeling like confident in it, mm -hmm. um, I always feel like that's helpful for the independent work because otherwise a lot of our kiddos with dyslexia or struggling readers are just going to kind of do something else or check out or not not really be engaged because it's hard when it's not making sense to you it's hard to be engaged um so they, they really benefit from that so yeah 
partner if you're not able to like directly be with them? Yeah, if you can't be directly with them as a teacher, which I totally understand is absolutely how it is. It's not one-on-one -on -one tutoring like what I'm used to doing. So, um, so getting that and, um, but also just being able to kind of check in with them and, um, you know, have them come to you to ask you questions if like you're at your desk or something like that and you have them working independently and also just kind of keeping that eye on those ones that have those red flags and just going in, hey, you know, checking in like, do you need help with the sounds? Like, or like, and trying to figure out like, where is it that they're struggling and can you kind of pinpoint that one thing that they need work on that day? Right, awesome. All right, well, that's pretty much all we have, unless there's anything else you wanted to add? Um, no, I think that's, I think that's, it. <laughs> awesome. well, thank you so much for being here. I absolutely appreciate you coming and sharing your knowledge with all of us. And then if any of the readers want to connect with you, where is a good place to do that? Great. Um, well, our website is smartalecresources.com. And um, we also have an Instagram, which is smartalecresources. Um, and yeah, come out on Fridays and download our free games. <laughs> That's a good way to get started and see of what we're doing. We also have a blog where we try and answer a lot of questions for teachers who are getting into Orton-Gillingham and explicit reading instruction. And if you have questions like that, we try to really answer a lot of people's questions around that really specific working with kids with learning disabilities kind of area. Um, awesome. Yeah. Well, I will leave those links in the blog. I'm going to be going over and grabbing your Friday freebies as well. Super excited about that. Yeah. Absolutely. Thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it. Um, I just love, you know, getting to work with these kiddos and get to talk about it. So reach out anytime. Will do. Thanks, Becky. All right. Bye. Bye.